guys hear me okay? Is that on? Yeah. Well, it's good to be here. I hope, uh, hope everyone had a, a good Christmas, good couple of days off, getting, getting to catch up with family and, and relax a bit. Um, we're, it's kind of crazy. We're already getting into 2024. We're uh, already getting into week three of this class. Um, time flies, okay? And pretty appropriate statement for um, the material we're going to get into, into tonight and looking at time. Um, for those who maybe haven't been here the first couple weeks, um, we've been looking at the book of Ecclesiastes and I've even called it a journal or a diary, just the personal writings of, of Solomon, um, um, King Solomon at the time. Okay, there we go. Um, one described as one of the wisest men uh, that we find in the Bible. And uh, through the first two chapters, as we kind of look at a review, um, he comes right out and states, of course, what we're all familiar with by now, that all of these things that are listed here are vanity. And life under the sun, meaning life apart from heaven, apart from God, uh, boils down to vanity and starts listing out um, several reasons why, give some conclusions. But for, the, for these first two chapters, he sort of has embarked on this conquest through these writings. Um, he's looked at um, trying a life of pleasure, almost like an adventure dive of pleasure, and all these different things that were described and ultimately came down um, to the conclusion that all of it was vanity. Looked at the life of being, the life of, one who is wise and the, one, the life of one who is foolish. Uh, considered, both of them, considered that the life of the wise, a, a wise person must be better than one of the fool. Sure, he's correct, but ultimately the conclusion was what? Both will die. Both come to the same ending conclusion. Both have to meet God. Uh, looked at a life of activity, of work, of career, um, personal achievements, and um, filling his life up with that, and examining that, coming to the same conclusion. One, and, and one thing to kind of comment on is the first couple chapters and, and different points throughout this book are not the most positive, most uh, exciting or uplifting thing to read. It can be a bit melancholy, a bit down or depressing. But there has been a couple of um, sprinkles of, I guess, positive conclusions that he's made, and one of them that we talked about last week um, I apologize for having to rush through last week. I think I got quite a bit of material and um, had to rush through at the end. But the ending point there, that being satisfaction, can be found. It can be found from God. And truly, it's, it's a gift from God. Um, contentment in, one li in one's life is harder to, to gain than we might think. But truly, the good things in life, the simple things in life, are a gift from God and should be acknowledged as such. He's going to touch a little bit more on that kind of in, in chapter three as we, um, as we go on to tonight. So, um, so let's go ahead and dig into it. I'm just going to set this here. So starting in chapter three, just in verse one, he says, kind of takes a, takes a different turn here. We talked about those previous things that we discussed, um, kind of tangible monetary things that we can all relate to starts talking about time. He says there in verse 1, there is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. And again, it's key what he says there, under heaven, under the sun. Uh, he's made this, made this statement several times throughout this book. Really what he's saying is, on this, here on this earth, apart from God, looking at it from that perspective. It's kind of important to check in with that, I guess, every now and again throughout this book to remind yourself because it can get a bit confusing reading some of these things and you might think, no, that's important or no, we may need that or I might disagree with that. But it's from the perspective of looking at them for what they are here on this earth and that's it, plainly. So, in verse 2, there's a time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. 
a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to shun embracing. Continue on verse 6. It says, a time to search, and a time to give up as lost, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart, and a time to sew together, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. So, a bit of a mouthful there to read, but I'm sure we've all read that, heard that at certain points in our lives, certain instances. It's a, probably one of the more famous verses in Ecclesiastes, probably one of the more well-known um, passages in the secular world, just in the Bible. Uh, but there's a lot to dig into here. Uh, there's a lot of conclusions, parallels, and things we can draw from this. Oh yeah, that's not bad. I was really hoping that would come out legible. So I can read that from here, so I'm hoping you can too. But just trying to list these things out. And 14 different um, comparing and contrasting events. And I kind of will just sort of start asking everyone's opinion here, but some of the things I draw from this and, and the importance of, some of the importances of this, this passage, to me it points out plainly the certainty of time and of purpose. And I say that meaning that applies to everyone. Uh, believer, non-believer, any person who has ever existed, any person who will exist. Um, there is no escaping these things, and they're a pretty broad set of, uh, of events, and I put there in everything in between. They're two complete opposite examples, each one of the 14, so anything that happens in between that is also relevant. And I think that's what he's trying to, to describe here, too. And I think when I first, you know, would, would hear this passage in teenage or young 20s, years, whatever, you kind of read that and think, okay, yeah, sure. You know, that's, there, there are bad things that happen to people and some things are unexplainable. You hear some things on the news. Um, you know, that's really sad. That's really tragic. Sorry to hear that. And, uh, but you just kind of give a subconscious, I, I don't know if I'll ever have to deal with maybe seven, eight of those things on there. Um, well, I can tell you, and I'm sure you would all agree, you know, I'm only 30 years old, and only 30 years old, and um, to one extent or another, I've experienced about all these things, uh, to some degree or another, and I, I would venture to say everyone here at some, at, at some capacity or some intensity has experienced these things as well. And they're humbling, and it's humbling to see Solomon put all these things out here. And you could almost preach an entire lesson or do an entire class, really, on, on this and go a million different directions. So I sort of want to put these out here and sort of simplify it tonight. But before I kind of move on to the next slides, I kind of want to ask, what are some other perspectives maybe some may have? Uh, Kate. Interesting, yeah. I like what you said there at the end. Reading something like this can be great comfort. Um, maybe initially uh, someone wouldn't quite draw that conclusion. Um, it's an interesting example from, from your perspective looking at young people who've gone through some pretty intense things. But everything here, um, 
comes with the, the notion that this too will pass, the good and the bad. Um, so maybe that's a little bit what you're referencing there, Kate. Does anyone else have anything they want to say? Elise. Sorry. Definitely, I agree. Janine. And just, just briefly, it's telling us that all our life is pretty much a beginning to end. All through life. From one extreme, you will experience one extreme to the other. One beginning and one end. Yeah. At, at some point in your life, may, you know, everyone, just plug it in, whatever applies to you, may not exactly be the same example, but will carry the same... Um, connotation or the same meaning that will apply to that, basically. Um, so those are all good points and certainly all true. Like I said, it, it, it has many different applications, but kind of how I see Solomon and what he's been writing about and, and the, the relevance of what does this all mean? What is the point? Does this add up to anything meaningful? Um, I think is, is narrowing down to a, a certain conclusion. Ian. How am I supposed to make sense of this? There's certainly a much, there is some depth there to some of these examples that you could just picture Solomon in all of his wisdom deeply contemplating these things as he's writing this. And in the next passage here, he gets to one of those conclusions again, and, and it's the similar theme that we've been going throughout this book. It says there in verse 9, directly after, what profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils. And basically he's saying, all those things that you toil in or participate in or struggle in throughout your life, whether short or long, um, what is the profit? What is the profit? I'll ask you guys. No one. Certainly. And, and, and towards kind of here in a, in, a, in a little bit he talks about how we can get that satisfaction get it through God kind of what he, I think he's saying here is um, you know when, when he talked about in verse 1 everything under heaven under the sun you know in the context of, of the, as apart from God these are kind of what Ian's saying just a series of events and things that will happen to you in your life and um, sort of I guess add up to nothing if, they, if you look at them for what they are, uh, just in that context here on this earth, it happens to everybody. Like I, I spent five minutes here talking about all of us here in this room have experienced these things to some degree or another. They're all different. Um, they all to apply to us differently. But if there's really no sense in it, they're just events that happen to us, what is, what is the point of that? If there's no profit... Well, then what's the point? I think that's kind of what that statement sort of caps there at the end. And just to write it out, it's just all the events of the life described, you know, if you could sum that up in somebody's life and plug in all the, the things there, when put together, don't do, or do not equal something meaningful. And that's what we've been talking about these last couple of weeks is Solomon's quest to find meaning and purpose unless or you consider that which is outside of time. And so, sort of mentioned that last week, 
you know, when he was saying, what is the point of all this under the sun? Well, maybe we need to start looking above the sun. You know, what is all the point of these things that happen within the context of time? We live in time. God created time. We are subject to time. Time is a fascinating topic in a, or concept in and of itself. But to really understand these things, ironically, we need to look outside of the perspective of time. So he sort of starts to get into that here in, in verse 10. Um, so let's move on. Let's read on here. He says, I have seen the task which God has given to the sons of man with which to occupy themselves. All these things that, that we just read, all these things that we toil in, calls them tasks. It says he has made everything appropriate, the, in, in some translation, translations say beautiful, in its time. So he has made everything appropriate or beautiful in its time. In verse 11, he has also set eternity in their hearts. I should say harder hearts. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. Now to me, this is kind of one of those key verses or key passages here uh, in this book and one that should really stick with us and carries a lot of weight with what we were, are talking about tonight and, and kind of sets the tone going forward. But mentions this, well, first I'll talk about how, these things that we just talked about. He says he makes everything appropriate or beautiful in its time. So we just spent time asking the question, how do we make sense of these basically random events that happen to us all in one context or another, individually, randomly, how do we make sense of that? Then he talks about, um, in verse 11, he has set eternity in their heart. What, what exactly, if you could describe what that means, as God has set eternity in our heart, how, how has he done that, or what exactly does that mean? Larry. And that's, that's really a, a great way to put it, and it's exactly what's said here. And it's an interesting balance because he has, in a sense, given us a hint or implanted the, the elementary principles, I guess, of what eternity is. We understand, I guess, the concept to a certain extent. When you sit and think about it for, you know, 20 minutes or so, your head kind of explodes. But he has allowed us to understand what that means, has set that yearning in our hearts for a to find the meaning of life here on this earth and what is after this earth uh, yet it says there at the end of that verse um, that man still will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end so even like you say Larry as much as we may struggle to <coughs> use science research whatever um, man knowledge or wisdom mankind knowledge or wisdom we won't even come close to fully understanding uh, what exactly he has done from beginning to end. Um, it's kind of an interesting, again, probably something that can have an entire lesson preached on it, a key but interesting point that God has given and set eternity in man's heart really is the starting, the ignition to the whole point of having faith and seeking God, seeking after him. That is really kind of the the, the, the key in the ignition point for me, I guess, I guess. So kind of looking at this, we now, if you look at this from an eternal, eternal view, when you read verses 10 through 11, what exactly, we've asked this question, how do we make sense of all this? Well, knowing that God is in control of these events, knowing that God has 
it is according to God's plan that he has, or has planned these things out, it brings a sense of peace to us, uh, a sense of understanding that we can make sense of random things in this world, whether good or bad, one extreme or the other. We can expect things like a birth or a death or mourning or mourning or laughter, tragedy or good times. We know that, and we can prepare ourselves for that, that in some way, shape, or form, um, I've been here long enough and have been a part of this congregation long enough that it's certainly true just within, within this group. We've all experienced um, great happy times with expansions of families, weddings, um, new members, baptisms, whatever it may be, certainly some sad times and everything in between. Um, it applies to us here. But it, but it helps us make sense of that chaos, and there's a peace that we can draw from that, from verses 10 and 11. If you read in Psalms uh, 19, verse 1, it just says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the, world of his, the work of his hands. So sort of just a, from an observa observation standpoint of this world, uh, that is evidence in and of itself. And that is a whole other topic that you can go down uh, to understand. But that is one of the things that just creation of itself that Larry said, that this is good. That is, I kind of ask that question, how? That is sort of one of the, the ways how God sets eternity in our hearts. The great creation around us. In Romans 8 and verse 28, he says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. So kind of an interesting parallel with this verse. This is Paul talking in Romans, um, talking to the church in Rome, sort of in a completely different context, but this to me directly applies because trying to make sense of all things, it says there, God causes all things. Well, all things, okay, well, what we just read in those verses 2 through uh, 8 there, pretty much covers all things. And a lot of people really struggle to make sense of that. Um, what is kind of the key parallel here that we see? If I could say it, for, for me, it's all things uh, work together for good. We're able to make peace and understanding of all these things of those who love God, of those who look above the sun, of those who uh, don't look here on this earth. Those who seek him, those who love him, can make peace and understanding and sense of these things that go on on this earth. So moving on here to verse 12. Goodness, the time goes by quick. Um, it says, I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all of his labor. It is a gift from God. So, God makes sense of the chaos around us. He also enables us to enjoy the life we have here. Uh, we touched on this a little bit last week, and, and Solomon made that point that true satisfaction comes from God and the simple things that we can enjoy in life come from God and we should give thanks to God. It's exactly what he's saying here. Um, why is this so important for us as Christians? Why is it important for us to acknowledge, um, to be able to enjoy the life here that can't be done truly without acknowledging that it comes from God? What do you think? If I had to give a reason, oh, Mark. Mark.
Yeah, and it certainly won't last uh, the, the, the time period that uh, happiness with Christ in your heart will. Mitch. Yeah, he spent. Yeah, he spent a good, Solomon spent a good chunk of chapter two pointing out the irony of people who drive themselves mad or um, to an unending conquest to, to, fulfill that hunger of, of this spiritual hole that's in them. And he's, in that particular context, he's talking about work and acquiring with riches and, and, and wealth and having to leave it behind, but makes the ultimate point that true satisfaction can be had no matter your situation, no matter your type of riches or where you're at. That in and of itself, that, that can only be found in one way. And, it, and that in and of itself is a gift from God. If, that, if that's a fact, that is truly does not come from man as a gift from God. Makes the same, really the same point here. And he's going to make that point a lot in the next few chapters. And so he kind of kind of repeats this point, but um, enables us to enjoy life. What I was going to say, and the reason why I think this is important is, um, at least this is just what comes to mind, is uh, life is hard. And listing all those things that we talked about in the beginning is exhausting. And there are points in our lives whether we are believers or not, um, where we will be weak, even, even if we are a Christian, where we will be weak and down, and trying to center ourselves back on this reality that we can enjoy the things of this world allows us to get through this life with peace and be able to focus on what is the, the goal and what is past this life. I believe that you know, that the world teaches you that you should never be content. You should always try to better yourself, capitalize and continue to build, build, build. You know, that, that gets so blown out of proportion where it gets completely off track. The true, the true purpose and the true goal is to find that contentment and that, that quiet confidence of, of knowing where you're going. The world might think that's pretty weak, um, but truly that is the underlying goal and, and treasure that only comes from God. So let's move on to verse 14 here. He says, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add from it, nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take away from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. That which is has been already, and that which will be has already been. For God seeks what has passed by. And Kind of similar to what we were talking about, the point of satisfaction and finding that. This is a kind of another repeated point from last week, or two weeks ago, actually, with the passing of generations and making the point that really nothing is new. Maybe the world looks a little different, but the, the struggle of the human experience and of mankind, no matter the, what's been developed and the technologies of the world, is still the same. And makes that point here, but then kind of the, the key point to me was what he says there in the... Um, where he says that God has so worked that men should fear him. So, really, the point I draw from that is God provokes us, encourages us, or points us um, by setting eternity in our hearts, by making all of these things appropriate, by being able to find peace in all these things. It starts to direct you to a life of worship to God. And not just worship in the context of being here, singing and and. and and worshiping, of course, it includes that, but we know what true worship is. It is a giving your life as a, as a sacrifice and, and worshiping in spirit and in truth, not just here, but individually out in the world. 
Well, that's truly giving yourself up as a living sacrifice. And when you look at these three things, I was kind of going through this PowerPoint and got to this slide and sort of, as I was rereading it, I kind of thought, huh, what more could you ask for to get through this life? If you could have a God that helps make sense of all the chaos of this world around you, if you, you were about to go through life and you were promised these three things, well, I promise no matter what you go through in this life, uh, I will help make sense of all this chaos. I will enable you to enjoy life um, and show you the perspective that these things come from, you know, God speaking to this person, come from me, and, and then you can live a life of worship to me and, and gratefulness and contentment and peace. I don't know of three other fundamental facts that can help us get through those 14 things we read uh, and 14 different extremes in our lives that we all will experience at some certain point. Uh, to me, that is the eternal view. Uh, that is looking at it from the verse 10 through 11 perspective, that one who see, has eternity in his heart and, and sees life, I guess you could see it from an eternal or a, you know, I kind of heard it said, a, a vertical perspective versus a horizontal perspective. If you're just looking at life in this world from a horizontal perspective, you're only seeing what's, what's flat and what's here on this earth. Looking at it from an eternal or vertical perspective, to me, boils down to these three points. So does anyone have any thoughts? We'll kind of move on here to verse 16. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Psalm 127. <clears throat> Solomon is apparent that the Lord God on earth. Says, and, Lord, and let the Lord build the house, but let his enemies build it. Let the Lord keep the city, the watchman with the strong chain. <clears throat> the same be the right of birds, but let the ocean be the right of the father. For such the Lord is the Lord God. Dave makes the point in Psalm 127. The vanity of, of one who stays up late and worries about what he's going to eat, what he's going to have the next day, but God brings that peace to those who, like you're saying, basically essentially trust in him. But these are kind of the three points here for the first, uh, first 15 verses that I've, I've kind of drawn a conclusion on. And then if we move in here to verse 16, we can kind of keep this, keep in the back of your mind this earthly versus eternal uh, viewpoint, horizontal versus vertical viewpoint. But um, well, well, first, before we do that, if you if you kind of go into these next, we'll read through these these next few verses, looking at them from an earthly viewpoint. Um, what these are to me some of the things that these things can breed. Uh, looking at it from a strictly horizontal viewpoint, looking at those events we read at from verses two through verse eight. I've seen it personally in my life with friends, um, with family. Uh, it can kind of breed confusion, which can lead to anger, lead to cynicism, hopelessness, and then chaos in one's life. And, I, and it's not, that's not, that doesn't necessarily apply that quickly and in those steps to everyone who may or may not be uh, in, a, in a relationship with God. But I think we would all agree that that pattern in some form or some, some extent does exist pretty prevalently in our world today. Uh, there is chaos because, in my opinion, people try so hard to make sense of, of the world around us. You put your meaning and purpose in our politics right now, it will lead to pure chaos. If you put your meaning and purpose into um, your career, and these sort of things, eventually it will lead to pure chaos. We've talked about those things already. Janine, do you have your hand up? Are you saying we forget our history? Yeah. What? No, you make a great point. That is it, is, it is weird to see how such a smart and evolved society, right, can make the same mistakes and have the same experience that Solomon is talking about here 935 years ago, so, um, or more than that. Okay, let's move on to verse 17 here. 
16. So furthermore, I have seen that under the sun, that in its place of justice, there is wickedness. And then in the place of righteousness, there is wickedness. Like, does this not, if you look at life from a horizontal perspective, is this not like the main thesis of what causes so much anger and upset and unrest in the world today? Um, I'm not even going to sit here and, and give all the different examples. We all know and can think of some. But think about if you don't have any kind of peace or understanding that justice is going to come someday to, to mankind um, in heaven, if you don't get justice in this world, you just don't get it. And it can cause anger and resentment and frustration and hate and terrible things can happen from that. But kind of keep that earthly versus eternal, vertical versus horizontal perspective as we read through some of these. It says there in verse 17, I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for a time for a time for every matter and for every deed is there. So, this to me is kind of the the eternal the, the verse 16 was kind of the the earthly viewpoint that one can look at and draw resentment and anger. And verse 17 is kind of what I picture the, the eternal man or the one that has eternity in his heart is patient and can make peace of the injustice where there is the injustice where in, in the place of righteousness and righteousness in the place of injustice can make, make sense of all these things uh, because there will be a time where every man in history and coming in the future uh, will be judged and will have to face God and give an account for all their deeds. It's a sobering and humbling reality that I think man tries so hard to not think about. Mankind tries so hard can, and does a masterful job at it, uh, but it's an in, inescapable reality. And people don't like to think about life in black and white terms. Sometimes it can make us pretty uncomfortable. But this is one of those strict black and white things that we just cannot escape. And that, it, to me, is someone who can accept that and make peace with that, has eternity in their hearts and welcomes it. So verse 18, I said to myself concerning the sons of man, God surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath and there is no advantage for man over beast. And there he says it again, for all is vanity. What, uh, this is kind of an interesting passage to me. What, I mean, obviously he's trying to say on its face, um, you know, the ultimate ending cap that all is vanity. We are all going to, I guess, die in some sense. But why is he, why do you think he's using the example of a beast or an animal and mankind and making that contraction, con con that contrast. What do you think, Kevin? Totally. Yeah. But when you continue to the very end, he gives the, the understanding as far as the whole duty of man is to fear God and to serve him. Right. And he's been giving, he sort of gives these little, little pre hints and pre, um, yeah, I guess you'd call them pre hints to that final de determination, that final conclusion in chapter 12. But it, it, it's just interesting here. He says, Surely he tested them for them to see that they are but beasts. Then he makes the, the distinction that, you know, 
animals and men both die, all is vanity. You both breathe, you both die. You can read it like that, and that certainly is, is, is a point, but I kind of just find that first sentence interesting. God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. Ian. Yes. glad you brought that mirrorism up. I read that. I didn't feel smart enough to include that in this. So <laughs> totally. No, it really, all it is, 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 is you're right, is it's the analogy of one extreme to the other. And you're right. He's using that same pattern here that, you know, mankind holds themselves in such high esteem as such a great creature. Really, you're just a beast. Um, really, you just, and that, the, the other kind of side thought as I was sitting there reading this, um, this is sort of the danger of evolution and diving into that and buying into that concept when you really boil that down isn't that just not you're just flesh you're just a beast you just act on your instinct there's no point you're just we all you know, I'm simplifying it but came from animals you know you can debate on where morality came from and consciousness and all these certain things but if we just all sort of happen you know you can't help but draw that conclusion well you're, you're in that category too uh, you're just a beast. But in this context, um, he draws the all is vanity um, conclusion. And, re- and reading again in verse 20, all go to the same place. All came from the dust and all returned to the dust. And I, it's one of my all-time favorite verses that what Adam is told in Genesis chapter 3, you know, you came from the dust and the dust you shall return. And that's a prevalent theme all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, Dana, go ahead. Certainly. Well, the dust, the dust you are and dust you shall return concept really addresses that. It, it puts man back in their place. And, and, and all, most, of, most of what Solomon's been going through is, is sort of pointing out the irony and mockery of man chasing that godlike figure through activities and pleasures and all these things here on earth, chasing that, but, you know, the vapor, the air, you know, vapor can take form and shape of something, you go out to reach it, and it's just, it's, you don't, you don't have it at all. Um, but certainly that theme is prevalent in, the, in, this, in this passage. Um, so let's go ahead and finish up here real quick. In verse 22, he says, I have seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in all his activities, for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? So there's that, there's that point again. Uh, I think this is probably the third time that Solomon's made that point. This point so far is, truly from all these things that I've observed, there is nothing better than a man should be happy in his activities. Uh, and and, and when, I, when you say that, again, what context is he talking about when he says that? He should be happy in all the, the pleasures and stuff and activities and, and work and career we talked about in chapter one and two? Is that what he's talking about? Kevin? Right. And, and understanding someone who um, understands that, let's see, going back, I'm not even going to try, um, that, that truly fears God, one that understands that they will return to the dust, um, can draw that peace, those, those three points we made earlier, can draw that peace from knowing that I am not God, like you're saying, Dana. And these extreme extremes and mirrorisms that are going to happen, those 14 examples that were listed in the first, the way to make sense of that is to make peace with that concept and to understand that. And, and that's really what he's saying here is 
you'll be able to be happy in your activities and find true contentment in this world if you do that. And he's saying, that is the best thing you can do, truly. And that is how you're going to get through this life and have hope and be able to maintain your fixation on what is above the sun and what is in heaven. So that's sort of all I have tonight. Uh, does anybody have any last points or comments? Mitch? Yeah, the other, that's, that's a good point. The other thing that's interesting, too, that I kind of skipped over in verse 21, it just says, who knows, or how do you know that a breath of the, of the man ascends upward and the breath of the beast descends downward? I guess he's sort of making that point of trying to, you know, say, how do you know that you're, you're so much higher than the beast? But one, one thing I was reading and kind of draw from that is, um, you know, we obviously know that the breath or the spirit of man is going to ascend upward and, and face God and face that eternity that, you know, beasts don't, don't understand animals of this world, don't, that doesn't apply to. But what he's making that contrast in verse 18 and 19, that, you know, men who excuse themselves and act like beasts in this life are going to face God and have to give an account as to why they acted like beasts and, instead of acting like someone who's made in the image of God. That's another sort of, of, of way you could take this. And Maybe one contrast he's making there. So, Kevin. No control. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just kind of like all these things. Those, those first things, are, you have no control. They're going to happen to you. How are you going to deal with them? You know, how are you going to make peace with that and avoid that chaos? So, exactly. Um, Janine, last point. That's what I was going to say. It's, Sorry. It, it, it says over and over, God gave us everything. He gave us all. And it's our attitude and how we use it. Totally. Your perspective and your attitude. Yep, attitude being everything. Okay, um, next week is singing, so we'll have a week off, and then uh, we will rejoin the week after that, get into chapter four. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate the comments.